Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Juan Torres Perez, and today I'm joined by my colleagues Amber McCollum and Zach Benson from the, from the NASA RCET team. Today, we will concentrate on the use of hyperspectral data for assessing coastal systems, including some aspects of water quality. Now remember, this is an introductory webinar, therefore most of the information will be relatively basic, but we will augment it with uh, some particular uh, st case studies based on different coastal ecosystems. Now remember, for this training, there are three sessions, each being one and a half hours long, including the Q&A sessions, <clears throat> and they were on January 19, the 26th, and today, which is the last section. The same material is also presented twice per day at 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern time to ensure the participation from folks in different parts of the world. Now note that you only need to attend one session per day. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here. And also here are our email addresses for reference. There is only one prerequisite for this training, which is an understanding of the basics of remote sensing with our course and those uh, concepts listed here. Also, here's a website again, if you can, where you can find the lecture materials and a link to watch the session recordings and the homework. And here's a, a link also for the fundamentals of remote sensing uh, webinar that we have also available for you. Now for this series, we will have only one homework assignment. The link to the homework will be made available later today during this last session and will be due two weeks after today. This is on Tuesday, February the 16th. The homework is gonna be a, a Google form that you will submit online. Now, if you attend all the sessions and complete the homework by the deadline, you will eventually receive a certificate of completion. Now remember, please be patient because it takes several months for us to process and send out these certificates. Now, in session one, we saw an overview of hyperspectral data with AMBER, uh, how it differs from multispectral, some portals where it, you, know, you can access the data. And last week, uh, we provided an overview of the use of hyperspectral data for land systems management. And today, we're going to talk about the use of hyperspectral data for coastal and ocean systems. Again, remember, this is an introductory webinar. And eventually, we will uh, talk also about some study cases. Towards the end, my colleague, Zach Benston, is going to provide a short demo on how to access and process hyperspectral data for coastal systems. Now, here are the learning objectives for this particular session. Today, you will learn how to identify regions within the electromagnetic spectrum where particular pigments absorb and how this translates to airborne or space-based hyperspectral data. You're gonna recall the main differences between hyperspectral and multispectral data. And we will contrast the use of hyperspectral data across diverse uh, coastal ecosystems. And then eventually you're gonna uh, be able to apply techniques to access, download, and display hyperspectral data for coastal and ocean systems. Okay, before we talk about hyperspectral data in general, <clears throat> I wanted to point out some aspects about the photosynthetic apparatus or uh, photosynthetic organisms. And particularly talk a little bit about the different pigments or compounds that are that absorb within the visible range. First, as most of you know, uh, most uh, photosynthetic organisms, they have chlorophylls. Depending on the organism, they may have chlorophyll A, B, C, C2, etc. And these are the main components of the photosynthetic apparatus. Most of um, here in the and there on the right, we see a graph where uh, some of these some of these pigments absorb. 
you see that the chlorophylls in particular, they usually absorb in the uh, blue and the red region of the spectrum. This is why, for instance, we see the plants, uh, most plants are green. Now, there are other pigments uh, also associated with some photosynthetic organisms, and here are some examples of them. Phycobilisomes, for instance, uh, they uh, absorb in, in completely different regions of the spectrums. Phycoerythrin is a pigment that is characteristic of uh, red algae, and it absorbs within the blue, mid blue, to about the uh, yellowish or orangish, uh, orange part of, of the spectrum. And eventually, this is why we see red algae as, as red, because it emits on the red. And then phyco, uh, phycocyanin, it's a pigment that is characteristic of uh, uh, cyanobacteria. And phycocyanin, as you see here in the graph, absorbs mostly on the green to red part of the spectrum. Now, both of these pigments, they are uh, they work as uh, like harvesting antennas in the photosynthetic apparatus. And as I said, they capture photons between the green and the red part of the, of the spectrum, uh, some of them. Then there are other pigments associated with uh, photosynthetic organisms are the carotenes, which are mostly for photoprotection. And some of them are the uh, carotenoids like peridine, which is characteristic of corals, or so Sosantelli inside the corals, beta carotene and others. And there are xanthophylls like diadonosanthin and cyaxanthin, which also uh, help in, in photoprotection as well. So you see here in the graph where uh, typically where most of these pigments absorb in the, uh, in the, in the visible range. And this is going to be key eventually for translating the, uh, this information into the hyperspectral data when, when it's collected by different uh, sensors. Now let's take a look at uh, how in situ data collected with a handheld spectral radiometer, in this case, a, a JER 1500 that has 512 spectral bands with a nominal bandwidth of approximately 1.5 nanometers uh, shows, and it shows differences in the uh, visible spectrum uh, between four typical core of components, in this case of the carbium. For example, we have uh, Poridis asteroides, which is a most heat coral, uh, an organism which is also uh, a relative of corals, uh, Palitoa calibaerum, a zoanthid, and then uh, for comparison purposes, also I included here uh, data from red mangroves and also uh, turtle grass, seagrass, uh, as well. This is uh, some of my data. It's not published, but it's all of, uh, mostly for uh, just uh, uh, for showing the different different. Uh, uh, spectra of these data of these uh, organisms and how they how how they show in a in a in a spectrum. Um, the differences here uh, in multiple regions of the of the spectrum between these reef components can easily be seen with this type of of data, and it shows the advantage of having many data points through the spectrum instead of having three to four discrete points, which would be the case for uh, multispectral data. Now, here's again, uh, Amber went through the, some of these uh, in the first session, but it's always uh, it's a good thing to uh, go back again and kind of refresh our memories. The differences, most of, some of the differences between hyperspectral and multispectral uh, sensors. The multispectral sensors uh, have been the norm with, with satellite sensors in particular, but they are limited by the number of uh, spectral bands that can be used. Uh, on the other hand, they have the uh, there's the advantage to some of these missions of the longevity of the data sets uh, associated with them. So when you think about La the Landsat series, for instance, it's been around since about 1972, and the MODIS uh, series, uh, both in uh, Aqua and Terra, they've been around from since uh, uh, late 1990s or early uh, 2000. And uh, also, they have a fairly high temporal resolution on, on the order of days to weeks. In the case of Landsat, it's uh, every 16 days. And in the case of MODIS, every one to two days also. So there's a lot of data associated with multispectral sensors that can be used for both land and coastal and ocean systems. On the other hand, hyperspectral data, so far, uh, there are very limited number of satellite-based sensors that are hyperspectral. Uh, we have talked a little bit about Hyperion, 
which is on board was on board the uh, EO-1 uh, spacecraft. And data from Hyperion is available from the year 2000 to about 2017, when it was uh, decommissioned. Now, it has, uh, Hyperion had a 30 meter spa uh, spatial resolution and 220 bands at 10 nanometers. Um, there are some, uh, there are mission specific, for instance, uh, the HICO, the hyperspectral imager for the coastal ocean, which was on board uh, of the International Space Station. And it had, there's limited data available for HICO, but HICO, uh, uh, the most important, one of the most important things is that HICO was specifically uh, designed for coastal oceans. Um, but there's uh, only about five years of data uh, from HICO and for specific uh, areas also, because it, because it was uh, it collected data on a request-based basis. Now, there are uh, hyperspectral sensors that are airborne, and uh, we are also mentioned uh, AVERS, the, the Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer. There's a new version of AVERS called the AVERS uh, New Generation or, or AVERS NG, and also uh, the PRISM uh, uh, spectrometer, the portable remote imaging spectrometer that has also been flown in some missions, particularly some missions related to the uh, coastal ecosystems. Now, lately, there's been the development also of hyperspectral cameras for particularly for or man uh, airborne systems or drones that uh, it looks promising, but there's still a lot of uh, uh, road to, to, to cover uh, there, and, uh, and it's still a, a work in progress. Now, there are, uh, Amber mentioned in particular during the first session, the uh, couple of upcoming uh, designated deliverables and, and, and additional satellite based sensors, uh, particularly uh, two that are uh, also related to not only to uh, land based, but oceans uh, or coastal systems the plankton, aerosol, cloud, and ocean ecosystem or PACE, and also the uh, surface biology and geology or SBG. Okay, um, so here we have here we have the same graph that we saw uh, on the left hand side of the, we saw a couple of slides ago, um, where the data collected in situ with a spectral radiometer, and then on the right hand side is the same data set but adjusted to the four Landsat eight bands in the visible range, and you see that most of the spectral features that appear obvious to distinguish, uh, particularly these reef components that we mentioned before uh, in the hyperspectral in situ data are lost in multispectral uh, adjusted data. So obviously, uh, this is just for, for illustrative uh, purposes, but at least you can see here how different the data might look between hyperspectral on the left-hand side and multispectral on the right-hand side from exactly the same uh, targets. Now, there are some considerations when processing uh, hyperspectral data that we have to go uh, through. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, even adjacent bands can give you uh, completely different results. So it's, it is important to particularly to do an iteratively uh, iterative process to choose which band is the appropriate one depending on the target. Now, also, typical atmospheric correction algorithms might need to be modified accordingly, depending on the on the sensor. Um, most times, people still use some of the uh, some of the uh, typical uh, atmospheric correction algorithm, algorithms like uh, FLASH or TAFCA or ATREM or others. But still, you might need to uh, tweak a little bit there just to 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 make it more uh, feasible to be used with uh, hyperspectral data. And for some sensors, uh, there might be some additional georectification that might be required depending on the sensor. So for example, for HICO, uh, speaking about coastal ocean, for HICO, uh, multiple images of the same target do not necessarily always cover the same identical uh, uh, spatial coordinates. And uh, images of the same area are acquired at different times during the day or even at different angles due to the uh, ISS uh, orbit and repositioning. So you need, might need to do some uh, additional georectification uh, there to for make the, the images uh, you know useful. 
Uh, also, there's, and there's the uncertainty with overpass predictions that affects, the, for instance, the deployment, deployment of field crews for uh, vicarious data collection, uh, chips, and others, and this is usually you know, pretty costly. Um, similarly, for airborne uh, sensors, such as Avris or, or Prism, uh, the first, the field campaigns are usually uh, costly. We're talking probably on the order of maybe more than a couple of hundred thousand dollars uh, for for a field campaign. So that's something that you have to take into consideration when, particularly when designing the project or budgeting for the project. And also, there are the typical aircraft issues, uh, for instance, speech, roll, and yaw that affect the image acquisition and and might require uh, additional processing as well. Now, uh, unfortunately, due to the usual complexity of coastal waters, even with hyperspectral imagery, uh, benthic class classification in particular can be extremely challenging, and it's still limited to the first tens of meters of depth, even in the clearest waters, uh, for, for example, in, in tropical islands, such as the, the image that you're seeing here on the right. Now, different regions of the visible spectrum are rapidly attenuated in the first uh, meters, particularly in the red. And the same thing even more dramatically happens uh, with the near infrared and UV regions uh, as well. Now, the characterization of deeper communities uh, is usually only restricted most uh, to the use of a alternate means such as sonars or autonomous underwater vehicles with camera assistance because of the limitations of uh, airborne or satellite-based remote sensing imagery. Now let's see some examples uh, where hyperspectral data has been used for storing coastal or uh, ocean systems. Here's an average hyperspectral image collected in, in, in Puerto Rico uh, back in, 20, in 2004 in an area known as La Palguera in the southwest coast of Puerto Rico, um, before the massive coral bleaching event of 2005. You can see that even in this image of four meters uh, spatial scale, uh, features such as seagrass uh, beds, which in the, uh, the mid-bottom uh, graph here, and sand also uh, are barely distinguishable without any atmospheric correction, despite the shallowness of, of the reef lagoon, which is in this case about one to two meters deep only. Also, in very shallow waters, there's an influence of the uh, of the short water column that it's uh, uh, surrounding the bottom uh, surfaces. Now, in this case. Uh, the University of Puerto Rico, the particularly the Bioptical Oceanography Lab team, they used uh, black and white waterproof tarps that they located in different parts of the uh, of the reef there, and they then they collected spectral data with the same spectral radiometer that I mentioned before, the GER 1500, um, for water column correction here. This is a very tedious task, and it took a lot of uh, manpower hours to do it. Now, here we show the agreement between the average data and the field collected spe spectral curves, particularly in the red region, where uh, we can see the absorption of uh, microscopic organisms that are in the, still in, the, uh, in, between, between, in between the grains of, of sand. Changes in the water column composition can cause the differences between, that we see here between average and the in-situ data. And also, the average sensor was not specifically designed for underwater targets. This might also be the case uh, uh, of, of some of these, uh, or the reason of some of these uh, changes or differences between the in-situ data and the average data. Now, after atmospheric and water column correction, the spectral signatures collected by both average and the in-situ spectral radiometer are much more similar to each other. Other differences, such as those associated with the smoothness of the curves, are also associated uh, with the bandwidth differences between uh, both sensors. Remember that for average, it's a H band is 10 nanometers, versus for the GER 1500, it's about 1.5 nanometers. 
so the girl has a more smooth uh, curve. But in general, many spectral features are maintained, as you can see here in this uh, in these different graphs. Now, during session one, Amber briefly mentioned the uh, NASA-funded Earth Venture Coral mission. Coral stands for the Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory. The goal of Coral was to provide critical data and new models needed uh, to analyze the status of coral reefs and to predict their future. Now, Coral provided the most extensive picture to date on the condition of a large portion of the world's coral reef from a uniform, da a uniform data set. The spectral resolution for Coral uh, was from about 350 to about uh, 1053 nanometers with bands that were sampled at around 3.5 nanometers with the prism uh, heliometer. Corar, uh, like I said, acquired uh, airborne spectral image uh, data using the portable remote imaging spectrometer or prism instrument, which was installed in a commercial airplane, uh, a G4. And concomitant with the flights, in situ data was collected, were collected uh, to validate the remote observations. Now for each reef, the spectral image data were processed to provide reef condition uh, described by measurable, measurable, measurable quantities of benthic cover of coral, algae, and sand. And then they uh, use uh, additional algorithms to calculate primary productivity and calcification. These three uh, condition parameters, these parameters were analyzed uh, quantitatively against uh, these uh, about 10 different key uh, biogeophysical parameters using different models and different algorithms to understand the reef conditions today and to predict the reef conditions for the future. In the case of coral, for each uh, square kilometer of reef, it generated about 10,000 10, observations on benthic cover primary productivity and calcification. Between 2016 and 2017, coral flew over key uh, reef areas in the Pacific Ocean, including Hawaii, the Mariana Islands, Palau, and the Great Barrier Reef. As you can see from, the, from this survey on the map uh, on the left. On the right, you can see a coral image from the Northwest Hawaii, where the hyperspectral data was used to create uh, classification to map the locations, particularly of coral, algae, and sand. Now, the Coral Research Group uh, conducted a series of field campaigns uh, at the study sites in the Pacific, which included the collection of spectral libraries from the main reef benthic components, in water characterization of apparent and inherent inherent optical properties, diver operated video transects collection for benthic cover analysis, and measurements of primary productivity with in situ data loggers. All these data were used for calibration and validation of the prism images, which in turn were used for benthic mapping at the reef, uh, island and regional levels, as well as estimation, like I said, of primary productivity and calcification at different levels. Now, previously, we saw a graph uh, with some reef benthic components and their spectral similarities or differences, as well as some of the data collected by the uh, Coral project team. In a recent paper by Tom Bell and colleagues, uh, inclu including some of the, the co eyes of the Coral team, they simulated the ability of a space-borne hyperspectral sensor to accurately map the fractional cover of Coral reef benthic classes under different water quality conditions and depths using a semi-analytical process, uh, the hydrolyte radi radiative transfer model, and a multiple end member spectral mixture analysis or, or MESMA to estimate cover. They obtained best results for shallow waters of less than three meters depth for most typical reef water uh, reef quality conditions. And a proposal that at a depth of more than five meters should only be classified on the, only under low chlorophyll and sediment concentrations. 
In short, MESMA uses multiple class specific representative uh, spectral signatures to model each image pixel and to determine the optical uh, combination of each member, uh, end member spectral signature uh, and fractions. The technique was developed uh, and tested with average data originally by Roberts in the late, late 1990s for mapping Chaparral environments, but has been also been applied to kelps and reef environments by uh, Dr. Bell and Dr. Kavanagh's group uh, from UCLA for a while already. In the paper, the authors also pointed out the potential advantages of having new hyperspectral satellite-based systems, such as SVG or PACE, for assessing reef changes at multiple spectral and temporal scales. Now, here's a reminder of some of the characteristics of HICO, since it was, the, since it was particularly designed for coastal systems. HICO was used uh, to sample specific coastal regions at 90 to 100 meters with uh, a spatial resolution with a spectral coverage from 380 to 960 nanometers with bands that were sampled every 5.7 nanometers. The sensor had a very high signal to noise ratio that it is indeed uh, useful to resolve the complexity of the coastal ocean. As a demonstrative instrument, HICO was designed to collect only one 50, uh, 50 times uh, 200 uh, kilometers seen per orbit. The regions to be collected were determined uh, weekly by a scheduling team, and the focus was on providing high data for scientific research of, co of coastal zones and other regions around the world. HICO demonstrates coastal products included, including water quality, water clarity, bottom types, bathymetry, and onshore vegetation maps. During its five year in operation, HICO collected over 10,000 scenes from, from around the world. And this is a uh, uh, this is something that we showed also on the uh, during the first session, but I thought it was appropriate to uh, re-show it here because it's it's just a particularly cool uh, animation product developed by the Godard uh, researchers. Um, here in this animation, uh, this is a series of images that was that were particularly collected over Bermuda in August 17 and 2013. And it cycles through all 128 Heiko channels, displaying uh, three at any particular time. Now the sliders on the right show which channels are uh, represented by their central wavelengths in nanometers were used for the, for the red, green, and blue components of each frame of the animation. Now, the image doesn't have any additional uh, uh, processing of top of the atmosphere radiances uh, in, uh, in this case, but it shows uh, how you can choose between different bands, uh, relatively similar bands, but it shows uh, di uh, very different products. So it allows you to see how different bands highlight the various components of the island of the island ecosystem, from land, shallow water, or coral components. Now, quite frequently. Seagrass meadows uh, represent a mix of uh, seagrasses and macroalgae, uh, mostly brown algae. The spectral limitations of multispectral data do not often provide for the differentia differentiation of these uh, shallow water benthic components. Now, Cho et al. in a series of papers in 2013 and 2014, they studied uh, the use of HICO data in particular for distinguishing between seagrass and macroalgae uh, areas dominated in the in Florida, in the Florida Keys. The authors uh, found that uh, the Heiko bands, in particularly in, in between 665 and 675, and, and 708 and 713 nanometers regions, can be used to distinguish seagrass from macroalgae and propose the use of two benthic classification methods, namely the slope red and the slope near infrared for this purpose. And the models uh, were compared to other existing classification models, such as the spect spectral angle mapping or SAM, or and typical unsupervised ISO data classification for, uh, processes. 
their models outperform both SAM and ISO data uh, processes, particularly in the very shallow waters with an average of 65% accuracy. Now, similarly, on a, on a more recent paper by Heidi Dirsen et al. in 2019, they use uh, one meter uh, spatial resolution hyperspectral data obtained with uh, PRISM to map shallow and moderate, moderately deep eelgrass beds in the tidal uh, embayment of Elkhorn Slough in Monterrey Bay in California. Their group combined the hyperspectral data with a semi-analytical uh, inversion model named HOPE, or Hyperspectral Optimization Processing Exemplar, to characterize water column parameters and to show subtle di differences in the spectral shape and differentiate uh, between uh, different types of submerged vegetation. Particularly, we can see the improvement in the benthic reflectance retrieval in the bottom uh, right-hand figures here, and the agreement uh, collected with, uh, with diver collected benthic uh, cover data shown by the different color dots. Now, the distinction between coastal plant species like mangrove forests still need a lot of research. Here's some in-situ data that I collected in Southwest Puerto Rico uh, two years ago, uh, still in process. And it shows how similar uh, the four uh, mangrove species of the Caribbean are, are, uh, can be spectrally, in particularly here in the, in the left-hand figure. Still, to some extent, areas uh, heavily impacted by, let's say, disease or a heavy drought period might be more uh, moderately spectrally uh, different if their canopies, their canopies are, you know, uniformly uniformly impacted. Now, also, I wanted to remind you uh, again that last year we conducted a SART training, which included one whole session on mangrove forest mapping and monitoring, as well as this past November. In, in November, in, uh, there was another full training on remote sensing for mangroves in support of the UN on, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So I encourage you guys to uh, watch some of those if you want uh, some more additional information of how to process uh, data for mangrove uh, analysis in particular. But anyway, um, Mangrove ecosystems, uh, they, as we know, they protect the coastlines from erosion and increase, uh, uh, and increase the water quality also in, uh, surrounding them. Now, continuous monitoring of mangroves is necessary to assess the impacts of sea level rise, for instance, and increase in salinity. Each species of the mangrove forest, uh, in this case in the, in the Lothian Island, has a different threshold for these uh, environmental parameters. So understanding the composition uh, is important to, uh, for conservation efforts. Here's a study uh, by Harry et al, a recent study until 2020, that used average NG data, airborne data, uh, in the hopes of creating a species level vegetation uh, classification in the Lothian Island in the east coast of India. In addition to hyperspectral data, they also examined uh, multispectral data to compare the target capability uh, of uh, specific vegetation type classifications. Data was analyzed from the Landsat OLI and uh, Sentinel-2, uh, also as well with Hyperion and uh, the average NG data. Now Landsat and Sentinel performed similarly but with more spectral information rendered by the hyperspectral data, Hyperion and uh, Average perform much better at more specific uh, and more specific classifications and receive higher accuracy scores also. Now the Average NG performed the best and was able to provide more, many more uh, species level uh, classifications. Now, this is what we should expect from a, from a hyperspectral remote sensor. The more bands available to capture reflectance, the easier it should be to distinguish between different vegetation types. Performance of average in this case is particularly notable given how complex the, uh, the environment in this location is. However, it is important to note that average NG also has the highest 
uh, spatial resolution of any of the other sensors that, sensors that were used for this study, which also contributed to the accuracy as well. Algal blooms can and cannot be toxic depending on the organisms that bloom. Hyperspectral data can be particularly useful for detecting specific types of bloom and therefore for monitoring coastal and ocean waters prone to the development of these. Here's an example of a not necessarily harmful algal uh, or plankton bloom. In this case, we see the detection of a bloom of a globally distributed non-toxic uh, ciliate known as mesodinium rubrum. Uh, the ciliate produces in intense uh, red color blooms. And here on the left-hand side, uh, a modest image from, uh, from uh, 2012 shows an elevated chlorophyll A fluorescence patch but due to the limited availability of visible bands of Imodis, the type of bloom cannot be distinguished compared to an, and, and here we can compare it with, to an image of, uh, of Heiko on the same day that shows the typical yellow fluorescence of uh, phycoerythrin, which is the main pigment uh, in this particular case. The middle photos uh, here show uh, how the mesodinium uh, bloom looks like from a boat. And below here is a microscopic photograph of the, of the organism. Mesodinium is a mixotrophic, uh, as it is enslaves uh, chloroplast from its main food source, uh, which is a microscopic algae, but can also engulf and process all the microscopic organisms of the planktonic community. The graphs here on the right-hand side compare the remote sensory reflectance of uh, Modis and Heiko and show how the HICO data reveals many peaks and dips uh, related to the presence of phycoerythrin, uh, particularly uh, the peak that is uh, characteristic around 565 nanometers, which cannot be detected by, uh, by the MODIS data. The bottom graph uh, shows the pigment absorption features Here's a uh, yellow fluorescence peak. Bottom graph which shows the pigment absorption features of these uh, this uh, organism uh, pigments, uh, and includes uh, chlorophylls and other pigments like uh, alosantin and phycoerythrin. Uh, uh, here, for reference, is the AS uh, as an PE on the graph uh, in the legend, respectively. And this is data from Heidi Dirsen also at all from 2015. Now, here's a, a data collected by Bernardo Erol and published a few years ago uh, that shows the same concept, but in this case, in regards to the concentration of total suspended matter in a reservoir in Brazil. The graphs on the top are the in situ uh, spectral, uh, hyperspectral data collected with a spectral radiometer, and on the bottom graphs, show the spectral information collected by Landsat Oli uh, for the same waypoints and the same date. In this case, the lack of bands in the near infrared, particularly between 700 and 850 nanometers, does not allow uh, for the use of several spectral features to discriminate between the different sites. And you see here the differences, particularly between 700 and 800 nanometers, which you cannot see with the Landsat data. Now, hyperspectral sensors such as HICO and the proposed SBG with a fairly high spatial resolution, just, let's say uh, 60 to 90, 90 meters, have and will provide respectively the opportunity to characterize a wide range of watercolor constituents in great detail as shown by the high correlation uh, in the Keith et al. 2014 paper from uh, chlorophyll A um, estimates in the northwest coast of, of Florida, hyperspectral data can be successfully compared to classic studies uh, performed with multispectral sensors and similar or higher uh, spatial resolutions. In this example, the authors use an iteratively, uh, iterative process using remote sensing reflectance values from the HICO bands, uh, particularly bands 45 to 61 at 657 to 749 nanometers 
to assess which bands were most efficient for the retrieval of diverse water quality parameters, including chlorophyll A, uh, CDOM, and turbidity or suspended particulate matter, uh, based on the sensitivity of, of the different wavelengths to these constituents. Similar processes have already been applied to multispectral data uh, from MODIS and MERIS for about a decade or more already. But in this case, the authors took the advantage of the narrow bands of Haiku to come up with a more sensitive algorithm uh, specific for each of these constituents. Now, I will leave you with my colleague, Zach Benston, who will provide you with a short demo on how to acquire hyperspectral data for coastal and oceans and ocean systems and some standard processing that can be performed with typical remote sensing or GIS software. software. Back to you, Zach. Hello, everyone. As Juan mentioned, I'll be walking you through our data access and display demonstration today. Uh, but first, I want to go over some background information before we get started. So one of the most useful and comprehensive websites for accessing coastal and ocean remote sensing data is the NASA Ocean Color Web Data Browser. So I'll be going through how to use Ocean Color Web to explore and access data later in the demo. But I just wanted to mention uh, that this website doesn't just include hyperspectral data. It also includes data from multispectral sensors, um, and that's things like MODIS and BEERS. And so the data browsers available on Ocean Color Web allow you to search data products at various processing levels, and you can also specify a lot of search criteria to narrow down your search results. These search criteria include things like data product type, chosen sensor, spatial extent, and date range. Um, you'll also be able to preview the data to visually inspect for quality and completeness of imagery, um, which includes checking for things like cloud cover uh, that might end up obstructing your imagery and making it not analysis ready. And for cloud cover, we typically suggest using data with no more than 20% uh, or so cloud cover. So the link to Ocean Color Web is provided here on the slide for you to try out um, some of the data browsers after the demo. And to download data from the browser, you'll need to register for a NASA Earth Data account. Uh, you'll be prompted to create that account um, or log in if you attempt to download data from the Ocean Color Web browser. Um, but the link is also provided here for you to uh, the registration page if you want to do that beforehand. And this registration is typically pretty quick, and you'll need to, you'll just need an email to complete the process. Um, so not a whole lot of information on your end. And once registered, you'll be able to directly download data from the browser. And so in today's demo, We'll be using data from the Hyperspectral Imager for the Coastal Ocean, or HICO mission, that we've talked a little bit about um, in this session and the first session um, of our hyperspectral trainings. And HICO was mounted on the International Space Station and was the first space-borne sensor designed to sample the coastal ocean. HICO was in operation from 2009 to 2014, and data were collected over 128 bands ranging from 380 to 960 nanometers with a 5.7 meter bandwidth. Uh, in a variety of oceanic, coastal, and freshwater areas around the world. So HICO's spatial resolution is 90 meters, uh, with a standard scene width of 42 kilometers and a standard scene length of 192 kilometers. The full HICO data archive is available online through NASA Ocean Color web browser, um, and that's kind of what we're going to be going over in this uh, data access demo. So HICO data are readily available at two processing levels uh, through Ocean Color web. And as you likely remember from the last session, a higher processing level indicates greater pre-processing uh, conducted on the imagery prior to your downloading it. And in the case of HICO, uh, level 1B products have undergone radiometric correction, geolocation, and some additional corrections to eliminate image artifacts. Um, this data product provides radiance values. Um, and in order to make the data ready for analysis and for the processing, atmospheric correction must take place to provide surface reflectance values uh, that filter out the effects of the atmosphere. Fortunately for HICO, um, all level two products available um, through this online platform have been run through an atmospheric correction model and contain surface reflectance values. Uh, this is really nice because it means you won't have to worry about atmospheric correction with HICO data. So level two data files also include raster layers, uh, which display common assessments of uh, chlorophyll A and light attenuation, uh, which provide the metric for turbidity. 
So working with Heiko NetCDF files uh, is easiest using CDAS. Uh, this is the software that we're going to be using for the demo. Um, but I just want you all to remember that you don't need to download CDAS right now. Um, you don't need to follow along or anything like that. I'm just going to be quickly showing you some of the basic functionalities here on my screen. Um, and then if you'd like to explore it later, um, you can definitely do that. So CDAS is a free and comprehensive software package developed by NASA for processing and analyzing remote sensing Earth data. And CDAS brings together um, a variety of processing components into an easy to navigate graphical user interface, um, which is really nice because it means you can kind of just point and click your way through the data uh, rather than bringing together a lot of the tools that um, CDAS does. So the link to download CDAS is here on the slide. Um, and CDAS can be downloaded in Mac, Windows, and Linux machines, so you shouldn't be limited um, uh, by whichever computer you have. So within CDAS, you can easily open data products from a variety of NASA sensors, uh, reproject data, export data as new file types, manipulate bands, and visualize data. Um, particularly relevant to this training, uh, you can display spectral information of each pixel and apply algorithms uh, to derive things like water quality and classify physical features like bottom reflectance uh, and bathymetry. Um, so now that you're a little bit more familiar with the tools that we're going to be using, I'll go ahead and move on to the demonstration. All right, so hopefully on my screen you can see the Ocean Color Web website. Um, this is available um, through the link that I provided on uh, one of the previous slides, um, but I'm going to go ahead and walk you through kind of getting to that level one and two data browser um, that we'll be using for Heiko. Um, so you'll just need to navigate, navigate here to uh, the data browsers. Like I mentioned, we're using the level one and two data browsers. Um, sometimes these things take a little bit of time to load, um, but once you've clicked that link, um, you'll be taken here to the user interface uh, to access kind of a variety of ocean-related data. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of options here um, for the types of data that you could potentially use. Um, one of the defaults uh, for this data browser is MODIS. Um, it will go ahead and just show you that data kind of here um, on this example screen of what data is available. Um, but we're going to go ahead and unclick that um, and go ahead and click here for our Heiko data, which is what we're really interested in. Um, that's kind of how you filter by sensor here in Ocean Color Web. Um, and then we're going to go here to reconfigure page. And that will just kind of reload everything um, to make it specific for Heiko. Um, it's nice because it shows you kind of all of the places where there's Heiko data available. Um, here in this map, all of the red sections are uh, Heiko overpasses. Um, so we'll zoom in a little bit there so you can take a look. Um, and you can do a lot of clicking through here if you're not necessarily looking for a specific area, you just want to explore the data. Um, this is a really nice opportunity to kind of click through and see what's available. Um, and if you're just looking for a quick reference to see if there's data available in a specific country or a specific coastal area, um, this is kind of a nice way to do that. Um, you can also do things like filtering for date, filtering specific months, specific years. I um, mean, you can do that with some of the links here. Um, as I mentioned, that's kind of whichever dates you're interested in. Uh, that doesn't necessarily line up super well with spatial extent all the time. You can definitely see what data is available on specific days. Um, but I think for the use of this website, it's probably better to start filtering um, by spatial extent just because you're not necessarily going to see a lot of repeat data um, for every spatial extent. So we'll go ahead and pick um, an area here in the navigator. Um, there are some uh, typically searched areas available here that you can scroll through. Um, you can also specify your study area here um, just with your lat long values um, to get data within whatever spatial extent you're interested in. But we're going to go ahead and navigate to the Maldives. Let's go ahead and select that here. Um, that's just the general area that we're going to be searching and you can click here to find swaths. And so a lot of this data, since it's already available in the level two format, it will have uh, certain algorithms kind of pre-run on it for um, your own use. Um, this is currently displaying a, a classically used chlorophyll algorithm over the data. Um, not necessarily the most informative when you're kind of just filtering through data, looking to kind of sort through things. Um, so you can go up here to toggle to true color images. Um, so this will give you kind of a quasi true color image that you can navigate through. Um, it provides things like dates. Um, you can click any of these links for metadata. Um, it shows you the spatial reference there uh, down on this globe. 
and we're going to wait a second for it to download. Um, these previews are really nice uh, just to kind of get a picture of what's available with the data. As you can see in quite a few of these images, there's a lot of cloud cover. Um, so we're going to go ahead and select the one that has the least cloud cover. Um, like I mentioned, ideally below 20% cloud cover. And we're going to go ahead and click on that. And that's from October 14th, uh, 2010. And so it'll go ahead and show you two previews of that data. Uh, the first is chlorophyll um, that's popped up here. Uh, so it shows you um, kind of that typical chlorophyll algorithm applied to the imagery available in the study area. Um, so that's kind of a useful metric. It's not necessarily calibrated to the specific um, study area that you're working with, um, but it's nice to kind of have those pre-processed uh, kind of water quality parameters already ready to go. And then you'll also be able to see here uh, the quasi true color image that I mentioned. You can go ahead and do another visual inspection of that, a little bit more zoomed in. And as we can see, this image is pretty free of cloud cover, a little cloud cover down here, um, but certain parts of the image are definitely a little bit better than others. Um, and how you download data from this platform. So we've kind of selected this as our chosen Heiko scene. As you can go ahead and go up here, um, these two links will provide for you either the level 1B data product. Um, so that's uh, the level 1 product that's radiance values. Um, and then you also have this level 2 product here, which is atmospherically corrected and provides those surface reflectance values that we really, really want. Um, so we'll go ahead and click on that. And this is kind of where your Earth data login comes into play. I already have uh, my account logged in. Um, and so it will redirect you to this Earth data login page and then automatically download that that net CDF file for you. Um, and I, I don't think I mentioned this before, but all uh, uh, data available for HICO is in net CDF format, um, which is really helpful um, when we're working with CDAS. It's already uh, loaded with the, the processing and display data that we need to, to, to view this imagery in kind of the easiest way possible. So that's why we're using CDAS for this session. And so as you can see, it takes a little bit of time to download. Um, but I will go ahead and toggle us to CDES so that we can go ahead um, and get started looking at this imagery. All right, so now that we're here in CDES, you can see kind of the, the graphical user interface here. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention is that when you first download CDES, um, you're going to want to make sure that you have all of the data processor, processors uh, downloaded that you'll be using for data. Um, so, for example, you can go up here to the OCSSW tab, um, and then you just want to make sure that you're selecting any uh, a sensor mission data points that you'll be working with. So, in our case, um, we would want to click HICO. I've already done this, so I'm not going to run it or apply um, any of the data processors. Um, but this is just something that you'll need to do um, so that you can go ahead and start immediately working with the HICO data. Um, and I also just want to mention that um, this is something that's going to look a little bit different depending on what version you have. So this is the Mac version of CDAS. So it's going to look a little bit different from the, <clears throat> the Windows version um, as well as the Linux version. I believe that the Windows version is a little bit more complicated. You might not necessarily have this graphical way of uh, kind of downloading these data drivers. Um, but in the link that we provided in the slides to the CDAS download, um, you'll, you'll see some instructions there um, for how to do that for Windows. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cancel this since I've already done that. Um, and we'll go ahead and import uh, the data point that we downloaded um, from Ocean Color Web. And so this just immediately goes to my downloads folder. Um, I'm going to select the net CDF file that I downloaded um, for the Maldives, and I'm just going to go ahead and open the product. Awesome. So you'll see here, uh, one really nice thing about CDAS is that it kind of lays out everything that's in that file for you. Um, so what we're particularly interested in is uh, the metadata and the rasters that are available through the net CDF. Um, so I just want to go ahead and toggle through some of this metadata. Um, so as you can see, there are some options here for looking at when the image was captured, what date the image was captured, um, kind of the data source, um, what the processing level is, um, kind of a full gambit of metadata that you might need um, to describe this data, which is something that's really nice to kind of have right here in front of you. <clears throat> and you can kind of scroll through these, kind of get more acquainted with the data. <clears throat> you might be familiar with some of this um, from uh, Ocean Color Web when you're looking at uh, different data products. Um, but this is just a nice listing um, for the specific metadata of the, the product that you downloaded. 
I mean, you can also go here to look at band attributes. <clears throat> and this is just a basic listing of uh, the wavelengths that are available through Heiko um, within this data product. And as you can see, it kind of follows that um, pattern of uh, 5.7 uh, nanometer bandwidth that we had mentioned with Heiko, um, and then a variety of, of bands on top of that. So we'll navigate away from metadata here, um, and then we'll start looking at the raster products that are available. Um, what we're the most interested in here is the surface reflectance RRS. Um, but I also wanted to just point out some of the data products that will come with um, this NetCDF file. So you'll see here, this is just kind of a classic uh, chlorophyll algorithm that's been applied to the image that we downloaded. Um, and this displays uh, kind of that uh, classical algorithm that's used to, to calculate chlorophyll A. I mean, you can see some of the variation there. Um, same goes for uh, KD490, which is a metric for light attenuation. Um, and you can just go through and click on each of these. A double click will go ahead and display it in CDES so that you can explore some of these layers that are available. Um, and KD490 is a really good metric for turbidity as well. Um, but we're not necessarily going to focus too much on um, these pre-processed uh, data layers in this demo. So we're going to look here at the available bands. Um, there's quite a few, as I mentioned. <clears throat> But what we're going to do is create an RGB imagery, kind of similar to the last session in session two when we created um, that RGB image. Um, so as you see, we have a lot of choices here for wavelengths. Um, and we're going to go up here um, to the three raster band, raster band to create a RGB image tool. And so I already have a profile saved here. Um, but when you go into uh, this create RGB image tool, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and select bands um, and it will have a drop down menu. Um, one nice thing about this is it, it automatically displays the wavelengths that are available. I um, mean, you'll just scroll through and choose whichever ones um, you would like to use for your RGB image. Uh, Heiko is really nice because they have um, recommended wavelengths for an RGB image, which in this case um, will be uh, 639 nanometers for red, 553 nanometers for green and 461 nanometers for blue. Um, so those are just the, the bands that are suggested uh, through the Heiko website um, to create that RGB image. And so once you make those selections, um, if this is a new profile, you're gonna wanna make sure to click save here and you can just go ahead and give that a name um, and then it will just save uh, automatically in an RGB image profile uh, file folder. Um, but we're not gonna do that because I already have this one saved. Um, I just named it Heiko RGB and we're gonna go ahead and run that. So as you'll see here, we have a little bit uh, better of a true color image as compared to some of those other layers that are made available um, within the net CDF. This is uh, pretty much as close to a true color image as you're gonna get with the Heiko data. Um, and as you can see, it shows um, a lot of uh, the oceanic area around the Maldives. It shows some of the atolls. Um, so we've got a nice mixture here of open water, um, shallow water with um, some benthic features, and then also some above water uh, features as well. And so we're going to use the spectrum view tool. And with that tool, um, it, sometimes CDAS will prompt you with these messages, just letting you know how things work. Um, and so in the case of this tool, you're gonna wanna hold the shift key down um, and it will automatically change the ranges in the plot of the spectrum view um, to give you um, a better view of what the plot itself actually looks like. So that'll just change the X and Y axis limits. We'll go ahead and drag this slightly over here. And we'll give it a second. Oh, here. We're going to want to change the filter with that first, though. So we're going to take off some of these layers that it's automatically included there so that we're only looking at a plot of surface reflectance. Um, and that's the RRS value. So now that we've changed that filtering option using the filter button, we're going to click OK. And then we're going to just toggle over the image. And that will kind of uh, gather and collect all of that spectrum data. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the shift key and that's going to change that, that Y limit to give me a better view of what the spectrum looks like. So we're gonna go ahead and toggle kind of around this open water area. You can see that has a pretty distinct uh, spectral profile. Um, and then we'll toggle over here to look at some of this above ground atoll feature. And you can see how that differs as well. Um, this just gives you a nice, really quick look at how some of those um, spectral features will differ. Um, sometimes it can take a second to collect that data and buffer, um, but we'll just go ahead and give it a second. 
And you can see here as we kind of toggle into these um, below surface benthic features, um, we'll get different spectral responses as well. Um, and so this is just a really quick and easy way to go ahead and explore through an image to kind of see what type of spectral profiles um, you can expect from the imagery you've downloaded. Um, and I think this is a really interesting example too because we've got some very different uh, coastal features here where we have open water, above ground, and then benthic features as well. So it's, it's nice to see kind of the difference between those. And then from this work, you can kind of get a picture of um, what spectral profiles will look like for different types of uh, coastal or oceanic cover. And with that, I think that's pretty much all the time we have for our demo. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand things back over to Juan. Well, thank you, Zach, for that great present demonstration. Um, and here we're going to summarize uh, today's session in a couple of bullets. Um, so remember that coastal-based applications for hyperspectral data include the, the retrieval of benthic substrates, particularly in shallow waters, um, and the potential discrimination of uh, species based on the uh, spectral signatures and cover of these species, uh, but also hyperspectral data can be used to analyze water quality at higher spectral, um, potentially also uh, higher spatial resolutions as well, depending on the sensor. Um, also, uh, we saw uh, through uh, the SACS demo demonstration the, how to access uh, hyperspectral data, particularly from the NASA's uh, Ocean Color Web Data Portal. And here, uh, uh, also to remind you the, the different websites. And also, we included uh, included here the website for downloading uh, HICO data in particular, or just for general uh, general information about HICO, as well as the average uh, data portal from our uh, partners at JPL. Also, remember uh, that there are uh, upcoming sensors like PACE and the new designated deliverables, such as uh, SVG, which eventually will provide for new venues for assessing coastal and ocean systems uh, never attained before. So stay tuned for those. Now, thanks again for joining us today during this uh, final session of this webinar series. Now we're gonna move on to the Q&A session. Okay, so let's move on to the Q&A, and um, thanks, thanks, Brock, for, for uh, uh, putting it out there. If you can, uh, if you can zoom in a little bit on the uh, on the uh, document, because I, my eyes are not what they used to be anymore. Um, all right. Well, uh, before we go into this, uh, thanks everyone for connecting today. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of questions uh came in even before we started the, with the webinar uh sessions yeah, that that uh, shows uh, how interested people are in, in this particular topic and, and thanks Zach, again for for giving us that short briefing uh during the uh, demo so we're gonna we're gonna go into some of the uh questions here and um, um we'll uh we'll see how it goes uh with time also and and probably some of them will we're gonna uh, uh, switch between myself and and Zach and maybe uh, Amber also. So let's go into the uh, to the first one. It says, is there a specific waiting time required to get data from Heiko Ocean Color Web the uh, Coral Mission? So for for uh, for the Ocean Color Web in particular, uh, there's there's no wait time for downloading HICO data. Uh, the entire data archive is is available. Remember that HICO in particular was only available for a certain number of years, so that's something that you have to consider when you're doing your your analysis, right? And uh, and and you can download the data. You can do, just download a single uh, image, single file, or you can do bulk uh, download uh, options in the in, in in the Ocean Color Web in particular. And uh, for for some other types of data, such as the coral data as mentioned there, there's I believe uh, we can verify with the PI of the project, uh, Dr. Eric Hochberg. But I believe they're uh, they're still in the uh, uh, processing the coral data, um, 
uh, it was collected a few years ago, but but uh, but it's uh, like I mentioned, it's it's definitely uh, uh, you know terabytes of data there. Uh, so it's going to take a while, probably, for some of it to eventually become available to to the general public. Um, all right. Question two: What tool have you used to plot the correlation between HICO and water quality parameters, such as uh, it says uh, CTD, uh, so salinity, turbidity, CDOM? about the degree of alkalinity, pH, uh, salinity. Uh, I'm not gonna go into alkalinity or pH or salinity because of, quite honestly, there's there's only, there's very few, particularly satellite data that covers uh, those uh, those different features and I'm, 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 I'm even less uh, hyperspectral data, uh, if there's any. Um, but uh, but if you're referring to the to a particular uh, figure or image on the slides, uh, where there are associated uh, studies links to each uh, slide uh, for you to take a look at. And uh, for instance, level two HICO data products from NASA include data layers that uh, display chlorophyll A and KD490, which is the vertical attenuation coefficient and 490 nanometers. Um, uh, which is a metric uh, for for turbidity. Um, the the data are derived from, derived from from algorithms that are similar to you to those used when when uh, deriving the same metrics for MODIS or other multispectral uh, data. They just they're, they're modified for 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 this particular some of these particular uh, bands. The more more specific bands, and uh, so make sure to to look at those uh, case studies, and um, and if, if there's a need, uh, you can also communicate with also someone who did this question, and we can provide some some links to to those studies as well. All right, how are you? How were you able to extract question three? How are you able to extract the different uh, core spectral signatures? That's a very good question. Um, uh, in this case, and in my and this 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 was uh, the data that I showed was data that I've collected in the field uh, over the years, and uh, and in this case uh, the spectral signatures from corals and other benthic uh, components um, have uh, uh, we used we they were tamed using a handheld field spectral radiometer. Which, uh, in our case, we use the Spectra Vista GER 1500, um, which has been around uh, since the late 1990s, I, I would say. Um, but there, there are other brands out there, obviously, of different prices depending on the on the specifics of the of the instrument. Um, this particular data was collected underwater. The the particularity, I would say, of the GER 1500 is that you can they, it has an uh, uh, a housing, an underwater housing, uh, custom made uh, by the company that you can, where you can bring the the instrument underwater uh, up to about things about 150 feet of water, and uh, and and then the data you can yeah was collected underwater with the spectrohaliometer, as I said. Uh, some data that was not shown here has also been collected with the same spectral heliometer that has a fiber optic ca optics cable. And uh, uh, for, for instance, you can bring the samples, coral samples, uh, uh, under the you know the proper per permissions, and uh, to let's say an aquarium, and then you can do you can do the the spectral analysis there uh, with them with the with the uh, fiber optics cable. Um, and then usually it's it's a it's kind of like a standard procedure for this uh, uh, data collection techniques to 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 have a diffuse panel, which is a spectral on panel, um, to that that uh, that is that it's used for to correct for different atmospheric different changes in the atmospheric or water column changes that has have, may have happened during the data collection. For the for the for the for this particular spectral heliometer, it takes maybe a second or two to 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 do one data collection one one spectra co uh, spectrum uh, collection uh, so there's not a big uh, difference there but if you're collecting let's say data over 10 minutes uh, mo and, and you're disturbing the bottom while you're collecting the data that's something that you have to 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 to, to take into consideration as well 
and, and the, the spectral uh, panel in particular helps uh, with that because it has a, a, a surface that it's a homogeneous surface uh, all over the, the panel. Okay, question number four. Um, let's see. Um, okay, uh, Zach, are you are you out there? Can you help with um, number four, maybe five, since you're more, in, more uh, into the uh, demo of the KGIs in particular? Yeah, sure. So. So question four is, can you tell us more about the conversion of NetCDF format to other formats like uh, GeoTIFF? Uh, so a NetCDF file contains uh, a lot of variables, dimensions, attributes, um, and it can also contain um, a lot of different layers within that. Um, kind of like we showed in the demo, um, you can have a NetCDF file that also includes a layer for um, say chlorophyll or KD490. Um, so they're kind of a complex uh, data file package um, and the conversion of NetCDF to GeoTIFF requires that the user um, choose which variables and attributes you would like to display. So it really kind of depends on what you're interested in extracting from that file as to kind of what you'll pull from that NetCDF and then ultimately um, uh, convert into a GeoTIFF. Um, so there's a couple of different tools that you can use for this conversion. Um, a couple that uh, we're familiar with are Envy and CDAS. Um, and in CDAS in particular, since that's kind of the, the free platform that we were using for this demo, um, it requires that you complete uh, extraction on that NetCDF where you're extracting the layers and information that you're interested in. Um, and then you'll need to either kind of like reclassify or reproject that data um, to a spatial reference. Um, and then you'll be able to uh, kind of save that as a GeoTIFF. So, um, there's an export feature within CDAS that you should, in theory, be able to use um, to convert uh, files into GeoTIFF format. There's just a little bit of additional processing that happens before then. Um, and you'll notice uh, Amber's put a couple of links here um, to some methods of doing this in NV especially. Um, and if you're interested in doing that in CDAS, um, I would encourage you to kind of just explore that export feature. Um, and then you can also do some searching on CDAS's website as well, um, which we have linked in the slides, um, which has a really nice platform where you can kind of ask questions about how to use uh, CDAS in general. And then we'll go ahead and move to question five, which is apparently QGIS plugin for hyperspectral data, for example, the spectral library tool, raster data plotting, um, are not within the list of plugins. Is there any other way of getting the plugin without interference from the QGIS system? Um, so how this works in, in QGIS is you'll only have the plugins that you've um, installed directly uh, within your version of QGIS. So when you do that download in QGIS, you'll kind of get like all of the standard tools, all of the standard things about QGIS, um, but you won't have all of those plugins kind of preloaded. Um, so Amber uh, gave a really nice screenshot here um, where you'll basically just have to go to the top of your um, QGIS interface, click the, the plugins tab, and then you should be able to um, open the plugins manager, uh, do a quick search, um, for kind of whichever tool you're most interested in. Um, say that's the spectral library tool. Um, and kind of once you search that, you'll see um, uh, those various plugins populate. And then you can go ahead and pick which ones you would like to install. And if you look down there in the uh, lower right of the screenshot, there's an install plugin button. And so once you hit that, that plugin will install in QGIS for you, and then you'll be able to use it um, within the uh, interface. Great. Thank you, Zach. Yep. Um, all right, let's go into uh, question number six then. And uh, is there a way to get attributes related to hyperspectral features? Okay, <clears throat> so for for hyperspectral, uh, particularly for aquatic hyperspectral data, uh, they're 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 less the uh, freely available spectral libraries are less common. Um, however, you can use uh, hyperspectral imagery to identify a variety of benthic and, and water quality features and, uh, and kind, of, kind of similar to multispectral on the, uh, the uh, algorithms for hyperspectral imagery uh, are used to evaluate water quality, chlorophyll, turbidity, other parameters. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and benthic cover mapping is, is, uh, may also rely on the application of, uh, of algorithms or, or even machine learning. 
um, as with our remote sensing, it's, it's always a great idea to incorporate uh, in situ field data or field data during your, for your study area. And this is something that we can't stress enough, uh, particularly for, for underwater targets. Uh, the water column, and there's, uh, I saw a few questions, uh, similar questions uh, that, uh, 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 that we're gonna see in a moment, uh, but, but particularly for underwater columns, uh, uh, underwater targets, remember that the water column changes almost constantly. So that is, uh, you, don't, you don't only have the, the, the issue with the atmospheric correction, but also the water column correction. This is where, where it becomes really, uh, really important to do uh, to to have the uh, underwater data collected either uh, at the same time of the satellite or 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 aircraft overpass if you're dealing with a with an airborne uh, sensor, uh, uh, but uh, if, if you can't do it at the same time, as close as possible to the to the overpass, usually between within one or two hours of the overpass, so that you're sure or at least you're your, your, you, you, there's a bigger chance of having a similar uh, uh, water column uh, in the above your if you're if you're dealing particularly with, with benthic uh, uh, ecosystems, a similar water water column as when the when the satellite uh, uh, went through, right? Otherwise, you'll be probably comparing two different things and uh, completely different things and, and it's going to be much more complicated okay uh question number seven then uh you mentioned challenges associated with the drones to collect hyperspectral imagery well i'm aware of some challenges it might be interesting in hearing what challenges uh you're well of in relation to this application uh probably the ones that i that i that i mentioned are, are are probably the ones that this uh, that our uh, participant uh, uh, also knows, but uh, but there's uh, you know on these days uh, uh, drones are used for for collecting data of just about everything, um, but uh, but there are challenges associated uh, with uh, things like platform stability and geo rectification, you know the the, the issues with the feature and raw. Uh, of the of the platform, uh, whether uh, for instance for water targets, whether it's pointing as a sun or not, if there's sun glint in the image, or others, uh, also the sensitivity of the sensors uh, flown has to be taken into consideration. As um, for instance, in a lot of cases, we are using the you know commercial off the shelf uh, uh, platforms with what, what comes with them. They usually just come with a with an RGB camera and for uh, for USS in particular, there's a number of uh, new hyperspectral cameras that have been uh, produced, but uh, still their sensitivity, particularly for for coastal or underwater targets, is, uh, is still to be the uh, TBD to be determined. Uh, so there's 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 a lot of, of ground to be covered, I would say, um, um, <clears throat> just to to make this uh, uh, this uh, to 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 solve some of these challenges that are associated with use uh, we using drones uh, for for hyperspectral imagery or any other type of imagery uh, for that matter. Okay. All right. Um, question number eight: How do you know when typical atmospheric correction algorithms are not uh, suitable? So uh, ideally, and, and, and another question came uh, later also. Ideally, you will also you will have access to uh, field or in situ data, as I mentioned, corrected directly from the your study area area at the time when or close to the time of the satellite overpass, and that data eventually you, you can use it to validate the reflectance or other remotely sensed uh, uh, parameters uh, that that you want to me uh, measure. Um, there's uh, you might be able to find freely available data uh, in the CBAS. Uh, site and we included the site uh, uh, there. The link to the site. Um, uh, there's there's a there was a question about whether uh, also there's a you know in situ uh, spectral data for some benthic uh, uh, species in particular. That's that's on the, you can probably look into that the CBAS site uh, as well. 
which is a repository for uh, for NASA, particularly for NASA funded projects. And, 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 and it might be there. Uh, also, again, uh, uh, if there's, uh, from experience, if there's an advice that I can give you guys is to, if you're able to, with your you know project, if you're able to, to get a spectrohaviometer or collect your own data, um, uh, do please do because it's not it's not only going to give you experience on 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 collecting field data and processing it, but it's also you're you're sure with that data that you're collecting it from from the particular targets that you're interested in. Um, you might also know, notice uh, that there are image artifacts or a high number of missing pixels in in, in your process imagery. Uh, uh, if particularly if the atmospheric correction was not you know, appropriate for uh, for your data. Okay, um, yeah, I this is this uh, number nine was not a questions, but I but I definitely wanted to include it here and uh, because uh, we mentioned pace and we want to thanks uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Erin uh, Urquhart. Well, who's uh, the uh, applications coordinator for PACE and, uh, and provided this information. So if you want to uh, learn more about PACE in particular, and, uh, its uh, capabilities and how to get involved with uh, PACE applications, uh, please visit the PACE uh, website, which is the link is included here in this in this particular uh, question. So thanks, Erin, for providing that, that particular uh, feedback. We always appreciate this for from from our participants. All right. Question number ten: Estimating the absorption maxima for each uh, photosynthetic pigments is uh, possible by calculating the second derivative uh, from the reflectance uh, spectrum. However, there's a shift between the in vitro maximal absorption and in vivo absorption for the same pigment. So, does it exist a database? to identify the in vivo uh, wavelength for is each photosynthetic pigments from the second derivative pigs. Uh, the, the, the long, uh, the, uh, the short answer is uh, no, that I know. There, it, it is very true what the what our participant uh, is mentioning uh, about the, the shift uh, in chromatography, that it's what is known as a, as a hypsochromic shift where the absorption features of a particular pigment change uh, during the, the uh, due to the effect of different solvents are used for extracting the pigments, whether you're using uh, methanol or, or if you're using acetone or, or something else. And, uh, and there, are, there are two books that I, I, I highly recommend uh, if you can get a, get a hand on them, um, which I've used over over many years, and uh, and it's one of those that I always refer to when I'm, when when particularly when analyzing uh, HPLC high performance lipid chromatography data or reflectance data from uh, <clears throat> from uh, uh, from the field in particular, and uh, and and they have the those two books have a, uh, an extensive library of spectra from particular pigments. It's it's uh, their aim are, are phytoplankton pigments, but as I mentioned in the in during the presentation, you know, it's it's, it's also applicable to other to other uh, uh, organisms, phyto, uh, photosynthetic organisms that have the same pigments, and chlorophylls, carotenoids, and and others. Um, it, and, and, and the the book shows the uh, uh, the, the uh, where these pigments absorb and and uh, and how they and in which particular wavelengths. I again I highly recommend it as a reference and uh, and, and and I've used it over many years. It's the the phytoplankton pigments in oceanography book, uh, which was edited by Roy et al. And there's there are two versions of them, two uh, two, edi two editions I would I should say. Um, and the and, and if you can get a hold of both editions, I would recommend it because there are some pigments that they included in one edition and they didn't include it in the other. So uh, you have uh, you know you have a more <clears throat> a more complete uh, uh, data set there if you can get uh, both of them. Plus there there's all other other uh, references, uh, peer review papers as well on, on this particular topic. 
Can you uh, please provide references for water column uh, corrections? So yes, and I'll make sure that uh, that when we uh, when we go the period the, the document that's gonna eventually gonna come out in the uh, on the website to include some of the links to to those uh, papers that I mentioned. They're the classic papers of of uh, Chong Ping Lee and uh, and the classic papers of uh, of Kendall Calder and, and others that have worked on this since the 90s um on um, water both uh, you know atmospheric and water quorum corrections and and those are very useful um since they provide you know different ways of of assessing water column uh, correction and 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 they are very specific on the different uh uh the different features and different uh, components of the water column that affect the uh, uh, light absor absorption. Um, also, uh, there is, uh, how is it called? The Ocean Optics book um, by Kurt Mobley that, it's, uh, that is highly recommended. It's freely available online uh, as well. And I will include, the, will include the, the links to the Ocean Optics uh, book uh, as well. It's 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 uh, it goes from the very basic to 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 advance uh, different different levels. Uh, okay, uh, could you please say something about passive fluorescence? How's it computer some applications? So uh, one I, I, what I what I mention about this is that there's a there's a, a usual process uh, that it's uh, it's very commonly uh, used in the in the in the literature, which is to calculate the line fluorescence height, uh, which is a relative measure of the amount of radiance that uh, live in the, the sea surface uh, in the in the chlor particularly in the chlorophyll emission band, uh, and then uses a a simple linear fit uh, between two different bands at 667 and 744 uh, 48 nanometers. Um, and uh, and it's used to calculate uh, fluorescence, uh, chlorophyll fluorescence in in the in ocean color, and uh, and I included the link there as well to with more information uh, from the ocean color website about particularly about the uh, the fluorescence uh, line height. Okay, what model was used to collect in situ data shown in the slide? It was a Spectra Vista GER fifteen hundred. They have a new version. Uh, of uh, of this one, I think it's called the HR five twelve, and uh, and there are a number of others from different companies. Uh, we have the, used this one for about twenty years, and it has served our purposes. The one thing that I can say that I like about that it, it has its pros and cons. One thing I can say about it that uh, that I like is that it since it comes with a with its uh, underwater housing, you can you can bring it with you, you know, you can go diving with it and collect the data uh, there as well. And there's, 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 there's a couple of other, other, uh, other uh, spectrometers that, that, that they have done similarly. Um, so yeah, that's the one we use, but there, there are others out there and it obviously depends on your project budget or depends on the, on the, what are the specifics of, of the, of the questions that you have, that, that you want to answer. Uh, with your with your data collection. Okay, uh, slide eight. Uh, Coral spectra is it underwater? Uh, corrected from uh, water absorption. The spectra was collected underwater. Well, that's a good question. It was collected underwater with the with the spectral radiometer that I just mentioned in the underwater housing. But then we use a spectral on panel to do the correction for uh, uh, for the water column in particular. And like I said, it's a standard process uh, for uh, for this type of, of, of data collection uh, analysis. Um, is calibration based on ground truth or cross-referencing for other sensors? Yes, it can be done with both. Ideally, again, uh, as we've mentioned uh, in, in, uh, numerous times, ideally you will calibrate uh, an instrument Using ground-based data, your ground-based data uh, during the during the satellite or uh, uh, aircraft overpass. Comparison of field and abyss, zero water column correction. In that case, um, which I mentioned, and this is some this is a case that I also mentioned uh, a few months ago when we did the uh, remote sensing for coastal ecosystems uh, webinar. 
the researchers, and I actually went a little bit deeper into, uh, into these, uh, the details of, of watercolor correction during that particular webinar. So I encourage you guys to see it uh, uh, if you have the time. Uh, in, 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 in this case, the researchers at the University of Puerto Rico, the Bioptical Oceanography Lab, they use a series of underwater tarp, tarps uh, uh, to, collect, to, co to correct for water column. Um, this was a, you know, a relatively shallow site. Um, less than two meters, but uh, before and after, when you look at the before and after graphs, you, you see how even in, in, the, in shallow waters, uh, relatively clear waters in that area, still there's an important influence of the, of the water column uh, that you have, to cons you have to take into consideration when you do the analysis, particularly for benthic uh, systems. Okay. Uh, Question 17, uh, we already went uh, over that. So how are you able to extract the different uh, color signatures? Again, with that, with that uh, spectral heliometers, spectral heliometer. Um, uh, question 18, what tools uh, would you advise for uh, atmospheric, atmospheric correction? Uh, in particular, how do you manage the aerosol content, which is probably the most variable and hard to determine atmospheric constituent? Yeah, that is a, a quite complicated question, I would say. And I believe uh, most atmospheric corrections models, they incorporate uh, atmospheric data from the date your imagery was collected to, to eliminate some of the influences there uh, related to data variations in aerosols. Um, however, uh, you may have to explore additional methods uh, to, to minimize uh, the influence of aerosols in your data. Um, and, uh, and you may need to, to avoid the use of some pixels uh, also that don't uh, pass a certain quality metric there. Um, so keep, keep an eye of, uh, of for, for those image artifacts and, and exclude any data that appear you know, heavily influenced by, by, by some atmospheric corrections. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, there's also, the, there's an in-situ field, a classic uh, instrument that is used uh, for, for particularly for, for aerosol collecting data, aerosol optical depth and things like that. Uh, is, uh, is a Microsoft, Microtops, uh, <laughs> some photometer. And, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's one of those uh, you know, instruments that have been used for, for years and years uh, in the field to, to, to help, uh, with the particular with atmospheric correction. Um, is the hyperspectral data available for the MENA region free? There's a limited amount uh, of hyperspectral data available for, for that particular region. Um, since all NASA data is available, uh, freely available, you can take a look and uh, at the uh, special extent of data in the either the Ocean Color Web or Earth Explorer, or Globus, or NASA Earth data, and see if there's any other type of data available for for that particular region. Um, okay, I understand that. Uh, maybe we can go over a couple more, and then you know uh, because of the uh, for. Uh, time limitations, and, but, but but again, we're gonna we're gonna the ones that we we don't answer right now. We're gonna make sure to answer them in the in the final document. There's a satellite is not necessarily decommissioned at the exact plant date, like for quick quick cut. Uh, if so, how's the decision taken based on a set of performance indicators? Yes, it depends on how well the sensor is performing, and if the data uh, are being used by the community. Uh, generally, satellite sensors uh, last, you know, well beyond their plant date, and and generally NASA uh, keeps those sensors in operation for as long as the sensor is uh, is, is is working. <clears throat> um, uh, so each sensor likely has a set of their own performance indicators, and uh, and if the data are degraded past a certain threshold, then the sensor is eventually uh, decommissioned. Um, okay, why do average and in-situ reflectances uh, diverge more towards a larger wavelength in the visible range? It is because uh, mostly because of the the influence of uh, of uh, of water of the water itself. Uh, 
absorption in in those uh, in those longer wavelengths in the red and, and near infrared uh, region in particular. Um, since the number of bands a given uh, wavelength range is several times higher in hyperspectral section sensors than multispectral, will the response be uh, more noisy comparatively? Yes. Um, as the wavelength range of this uh, which uh, band decreases, the noise yeah, usually becomes larger, and this is why the signal-to-noise ratio is important to consider uh, with, with hyperspectral uh, data. Um, okay, um, all right, uh, question 23, is it convenient, is, uh, is it convenient if any hands-on training processing of hyperspectral data for any component like seagrasses, mangrove, coral, etc., cetera? Uh, do you consider this issue in the, in the session or future? Um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, any training like this plan at the moment, but we always, uh, definitely want to hear more about what types of trainings you guys uh, are interested in. Um, as more hyperspectral missions uh, plan and successfully launch, I'm sure uh, that we're going to look into you know, holding additional hyperspectral webinars. Um, if it, uh, this, kind, the, the, this question looks uh, so probably, it probably be more applicable to, let's say, an in-person, uh, uh, webinar, <laughs> excuse me. So whenever, uh, whenever you know, conditions come back to normal, uh, 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 eventually. Um, so this is something that we can uh, take into consideration for, uh, particularly for in for a future maybe in-person webinar, um, because this is, uh, I mean, if it's hands-on, if, if if it's it's actually. It's very important to to learn how to collect your your in situ data in particular when in particularly if you're going to use it for for validation of satellite or urban images um there's 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 a number of things that you have to consider you know the, the song angle and uh, and and the conditions and and uh, and a number of other factors um uh yes we wish we 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 could do those types of trainings in 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 some areas, but who knows? You know, who knows? Uh, maybe in the future, it's fingers crossed. Okay, probably we can go with this uh, the twenty four last one, and then we'll 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 do the rest, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, offline, uh, and then we'll make this available uh, for for the for the benefit of everyone. Are there any recommended? Uh, portable and lab uh, spectrometers for LAN applications. So the same ones that I mentioned in this webinar can also be used for uh, for LAN applications. Um, uh, there's there's actually a, a ASD is one of them that comes to mind. There have been millions for both for LAN and and and, and ocean. Uh, ocean optics they 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 have a uh, smaller less costly version uh, which is typically i think that this one is you know it's it's quite small it's a few inches small uh, a few inches large and uh, and it's connected to at all times to a laptop so it's definitely not for bringing underwater um the one again that we use the the 1500 uh, uh, and its later versions can be used on land and underwater targets and like i said there's there's a few of them out there. Uh, it's 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 a matter of of your project budget and uh, and the the specific uh, hypothesis or questions that that you wanna uh, answer. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna go with uh, number 26 and then we'll uh, uh, call it the day. 27 is is the same one that uh, that we mentioned before about the use of drones. Um, and 28 is same one as pretty much the same one as 26. Um, uh, the different species of seagrass can they be identified with hyperspectral data? I'm in a project in monitoring seagrasses in Campeche in Mexico, uh, but there isn't very much data besides multispectral. Most times with seagrass species, based on my experience, it's really, really hard to distinguish them spectrally. They are very, they're extremely similar. Uh, uh, spectrally, let's say you're comparing Thalassia versus Syringodium or others, you know, they're, they're very, very similar. 
um, so they 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 can be distinguished from some types of macroalgae, let's say from brown algae or red algae, obviously, because they have completely different pigments with field data. Uh, but uh, but when you're considering you know hyperspectral data with with uh, satellite or airborne images, and this is also where spatial resolution in particular comes into place, because uh, if they're just you know sparsely sparsely uh, located in your area, you um, there's going to be most likely the pixel is, is going to be a mixed pixel uh, with both components at the same time, and then you have to do uh, you know, spectral mixing and unmixing analysis and things like that to try to separate uh, the, the different components. But that's uh, that's a little bit beyond the, the, the scope of, of of this webinar. Um, but uh, but those are the things uh, to consider. Generally, I would say no. Seagrasses are, are extremely extremely similar uh, in spectral terms, and they're they're really really hard to uh, uh, to distinguish between them. All right, um, we're a little bit over time, so uh, I wanna first I wanna thank you all for participating in this webinar series. Um, Def, uh, with us, uh, definitely thank our our uh, my my colleagues and friends Amber and Zach for uh, for helping with this and uh, for uh, teaching some of the uh, sessions as well. And again, if you have any questions, uh, additional questions, feel free to email Amber uh, or Zach or myself to the uh to the emails that are that are on the on the q a document and, as, and also on the presentation and and i want to thank our the, our the whole team behind the scenes uh that are that are actually the ones that do the magic so that we can we can give you guys this uh, webinar series and, and and all the others uh, and also our our <clears throat> Our program director, Dr. Ana Prados, uh, as well for for her support on the on the NASA uh, capacity building program. All right, well, thank you guys, and uh, I hope this has been useful. And stay tuned for the next ones. There's a few other uh, webinars out there that are uh, pending in the next uh, in the next months, and uh, stay tuned for them because a lot of different in very interesting topics are, are coming your way. All right. Have a great day, great week, stay safe, and take care of yourselves.